Good morning from beautiful Brisbane, Australia. How are you this morning? It's great to be here with you. My name's Linda. I'm your Certified Trauma Recovery Coach and welcome to the Academy for Complex Trauma. Now, yesterday we started talking about the abandonment wound and how emotional neglect is at the core of complex trauma. And it was just amazing to begin talking and sharing with you, especially about denial and minimization and how important it is that we begin to recognize these habits that we have around denial and minimization. And this morning, we're going to go a bit further along the path as to what else we need to recognize along our journey to recover from recovery to remission and how we can begin to work with the well the emotional wound really uh, and so when you think about denial and minimization and the homework I gave you last night were you able to begin to see or feel where you deny what's happening for you emotionally and where you minimize things. Now, I know it was only overnight, but it does help to begin building this awareness into our day-to-day -day life. No matter how small the awareness is, we can begin to build on it each day. And as we build on it each day, it begins to open up our ability to relax a bit more, to let the body not be so bound up or wound up with keeping our muscles tight and keeping ourselves on hypoarousal all the time, even though it's unconscious. There is nothing conscious about hypoarousal. It's our primitive response in our brain that we developed in our childhood. Good morning, girls. Chan, Katja, it's lovely to be here with you this morning. Uh, sorry I was a bit late. Uh, you know, electronics, they just start. I don't know why it wouldn't start this morning, but we got there. Okay, so the next part of our awareness that we want to build on is around verbal and emotional abuse. And it can be much more damaging than the physical abuse. Now, that's not to say that that's not to minimize or put into denial physical abuse at all. It's just that with verbal and emotional abuse, we tend to compare ourselves and what happened with us to others who were physically abused and we believe we didn't suffer in the manner they did or we, or we believe that because we had verbal and emotional abuse, it wasn't as impactful as the physical abuse. And we need to be build this awareness into ourselves so that we can begin to feel safe to examine what happened for us internally. So the first part that we're going to look at is are we comparing ourselves to what's happened to other people or what we believe has happened to other people? And are we saying, oh, well, I didn't have it as bad as that and so therefore what happened to me isn't as significant and we need to put in an awareness around automatic thoughts i've done a video which is uh, uploaded on the youtube channel around automatic thoughts and how we can manage them or begin to work with them as well good morning charlotte um so the first thing is we cannot compare ourselves and our situation to anyone else because it is individual and all the professionals you know in the high up echelons that do all the scientific research will tell you this as well that the verbal and emotional abuse is significant enough to cause a wound that goes on for general well, yeah it can be passed on for generations um it's it's just amazing how it does get passed down uh, around the verbal and emotional neglect. Uh, in my family, it's definitely been passed down generationally in the women. So my great-grandmother, she deserted four young girls. So just, 
you know, don't you got to remember this is back in the days when no electricity, no running water. She just left four girls on the farm in the middle of nowhere. So can you imagine the sheer terror that their primary caregiver has gone? All right. So their father was out droving. So that's rounding up cattle uh, in the middle of nowhere as well. And they're left there with no significant adult caregiver. And then my maternal grandmother, so my mother's mother, her emotional wound was so deep that basically um, it's it's terrible to say it, but like she drove most people away um, because of her attitude. I mean, she's 90-something now, but she's she softened a little bit compared to what she was uh, certainly when I was growing up. But then my mum, uh, she carried it as well because um, she didn't love me in the manner that a normal mother loves her children. Like I know that a lot of you see how much I love my kids and my kids are very aware how much I love them and we need that, all right? We all need this as children growing up. But my mum didn't have that ability either because she carried the wound on from her mother uh, and ended up with breast cancer, secondary liver and died because she kept everything inside. So we need to be the generation that stands up and says, you know, these ab the abandonment wound is very, very real and it can happen even when we're living in the same house as our parent. Um, my mum was gone for over three weeks when I was around four and that was the first time mine started because I went from all of my family being there, so my mother, my father, my brother, who's only 13 months younger, so we were really close, uh, to everyone being gone and I looked at my mother as my primary caregiver and there's no communication around what, why was she gone? Yes, I was with my grandparents, my favourite grandparents, but it didn't matter. This is the person that we bond with, our mother, for me, and she was gone and I had no language for it. There was no communication in our family. You didn't talk about emotions. Um, you didn't even recognise them. So that was the first time that the overwhelming fear that comes from that begins to live inside of us and we don't know what's going on. We are too young to know or understand and we've come from generations of family who don't talk about this stuff. Uh, I remember my grandmother, and this is the grandmother that I was with, and this was a big revelation for me. I'd, I'd had Joshua and my grandmother had come up not to my place, my grandmother had come up to one of her son's place who literally lived two minutes from me, literally. And she'd been up here three weeks and hadn't told me. And I was just devastated. I'm like, who does this stuff, you know? And I rang her up and I said, why didn't you tell me you're here? I was ringing her other son saying, where's Nan, you know? He says, well, she's up there. And, um... I was devastated and sobbing on the phone going, you know, why haven't you told me? And um, she just said, well, we know we won't talk about it. Yes, you can come and see me, but as long as you don't talk about it. Come on, Penda. And um, I was just like, wow. So I went round to visit and as long as I held all my emotions inside and didn't even talk about how devastated I was that my nan was there, for three weeks and hadn't told me, it's like, wow, this is the kind of thing that all of us around the world have experienced that we don't or we're not allowed to talk about how we feel or what happens for us emotionally. And the fear in childhood is bigger than us or even our brain development at the time can manage. So this emotional neglect even uh, and the verbal as well is like where we develop our inner critic. So the verbal abuse, uh, it erodes our self-esteem and we don't build self-worth. So a lot of us are very aware that we've had an inner critic or have an inner critic 
and we are the hardest on ourselves that more hard than anybody else could ever be and so we need to do our inner critic work in order that we're not giving ourselves a hard time because it's driven by this fear that was developed in our childhood when we didn't have the language uh, and repeated emotional abuse infuses us with this fear and toxic shame. Sorry, I just need a sip of the coffee. <laughs> take a take a breather. <laughs> okay, so both the verbal and emotional abuse lead us to a place where fear and shame condition us to refrain from seeking attention so I want you to think about that both verbal and emotional abuse and I should say neglect lead us to a place where fear and shame condition us to refrain from seeking attention from expressing ourselves in ways that draw attention so we don't express ourselves if we think that it's going to draw attention to us. So when I was doing all this work, I'm thinking the fact that I'm doing a Facebook Live is like a miracle because this was me, definitely don't do anything that brings attention. And eventually we stop seeking any help or any attention. Now, I know that this applies to all of us, that we won't stand up and we won't ask for help and we don't say what we need because in our childhood it's all been shoved so far down that we've lived, going back to yesterday's, we live in the land of denial, okay, or as I say, we float down the river denial uh, because we've had to do that from childhood and we knew no better because our families have passed so much down to us uh, that we've just continued it on. Well, we have a choice now whether we continue it on or we don't, all right? It's really important that we make this conscious choice every day that when we feel that we're holding on to stuff, that we don't explode, that we sit down and put it in an order of what we need, okay? and become aware of our internal needs in order that we as the adult can take charge of saying what we need and how we need it to happen. Uh, we may not have a lot of language around it just yet, but that's okay. We've got to start somewhere. We've got to put one foot on the ground, one step in front of each other in order that we build it into our lives, build the awareness and then build into our life what we need. Otherwise, we speaking from experience, we end up in marriages where we can't say what we need. We marry somebody, and I did this two times, we marry somebody where we end up feeling unsafe, where we can't say what we need, and even if we've got the courage to say what we need, those needs never get looked at or addressed as something important, that it needs to either be on the table and talked about or the other person needs to come to the party and we work together to address those needs, all right? And think about it right down to the deepest parts of a relationship when it comes to intimacy. We need to be able to speak up and say what we need. <laughs> yeah, that's that's a long story, long chat show. <laughs> I could say, you know, definitely I did not know how to speak up and say what I need in the most deepest parts of my life. Um, but obviously that's changed. <laughs> so we can do the work. I want to inspire you that we can do this work and we can begin to use our voice. Uh, another friend of mine uh, going through a tough time actually stood up and used their voice recently as well, and I was like, wow, that's powerful. Uh, sometimes our adversities teach us that we're not going back down the same road again and we're going to start standing up and speaking up for ourselves about what we need. When we first start doing it, it feels really alien. Can I just say that? It does. It feels really alien to use our voice and to begin to say, this is what I need in this situation as well. 
And then when you're with somebody who's adulting as well, you sit down and we can negotiate how that's going to happen, what that looks like. And it's this beautiful, flowing, kind, caring conversation. And they're allowed to get their needs met too. It's a mutual thing. It's not one-sided. But we need to be willing to do our work so that we find our voice again and we also do the internal work so that we recognise what it is we need as adults as well. It's really, really important that we need to never compare our experiences with anybody else. Uh, as we've come through our experiences, everyone else's experiences will sound worse than ours, whether they are or not. It doesn't matter to us. The more we move along the recovery to remission pathway and we hear other people's stories, our response is, wow, I could never have gotten through that. And they could never have gotten through what we did. So again, it comes down to never minimising what you've been through. Never do it because it is, you know, as I said, right up there in the high reaches of people who do the research they know that with complex trauma, every single one of us, it impacts differently because we've all come out of it in different ways and we are different on a personality and character level as well. Okay, so I want you overnight to see if you catch yourself comparing your life even to anybody else's, even if you're watching a television show, do your thoughts wander down the path of oh, I either want that life or I would I could never have gotten through that life? It may seem like something simple, but it's the first step in being able to catch ourselves when we're thinking and comparing what our lives are like to anybody else's. Uh, I couldn't have done your life. I really couldn't have. Uh, and I know now, too, that other people couldn't have done my life and nobody... <laughs> We can sit there and say, well, no one would want my life. But that's comparing again. You say, well, we each had our own individual journey. And if I keep comparing my life to somebody else's, then am I living in denial and minimization? Am I ignoring the deep impact of the verbal and emotional abuse on my life? Am I not willing to address the deep impact of the verbal and emotional abuse on my life? And let me just add, being in a situation when you're a young child and you're a witness to verbal abuse as well, it is terrifying, absolutely terrifying. Um, I witnessed a lot of verbal abuse towards my mother and brother and it was terrifying as a child to see this happening, absolutely terrifying. And that's that terror that still sits there and can trigger us. But as we grow and go through the recovery to remission pathway and we understand what's happening for us internally, not just on the emotional level, but what happened to us with the neuroscience level, what's happened in our brain, we can begin to be empowered to stand up and take the one next step forward again as well. Um, most important, remember, all this information is new to our generations. We are the first one with all the neuroscience that goes with this as well. So please, 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 when you're working with the inner critic, tell it to sit down and take a seat in the corner because you've got this, okay? We don't need to give ourselves a hard time in order to keep ourselves safe. We need to have compassion that the child went through hell on earth, terrifying situations, and go, okay, I'm going to start reworking my life into a place and space where I want it to be, where I want to grow, where I feel led to, you know, put my feet one foot in front of the other on the ground and start doing something different. Um, and as a really out there example, when I started doing Facebook Lives 18 months ago, I was terrified, the anxiety, you know, perspiration. It was just terrifying for me because of the emotional neglect and it's we don't want to be noticed. It, it's just terrifying having people notice us. Um, well, for me, it certainly was. 
And it took me a long time to get comfortable with feeling safe enough to keep getting on online and sharing with you. But the only way through complex trauma is to keep giving our whole nervous system these new experiences. So even when I went overseas, when I was coming home, our last stop was Bali. So I was flying home from Bali to Brisbane and we get to the airport. Uh, for me, I like to plan things in advance. So I got there and once by the time I got through umpteen bag checks, got to the ticket counter, I had like 10 minutes to get to the gate, according to the ticket. Uh, I don't believe airline at, the, at this point in time. It's just crazy um, what happens behind the scenes at airports. Like they didn't even have the right gate number on there. So it can be very, very stressful just for anyone not with complex trauma. But for me to remain focused and adulting in that moment and go, right, I've got 10 minutes to find the gate, of course, it triggers everything inside of me because of the pressure, all right? And the pressure of not knowing where I'm going. I've never been here before. What's happening? And so I was literally dripping with perspiration head to toe, um, going to find this gate at this significantly sized airport. It wasn't small um, at all. It wasn't like, you know, you walk out the door and jump on a plane. Uh, which one of the airports was. And then when I got into Brisbane, I'd never been into Brisbane uh, where we at the particular gate where we were, and it was miles away from anything. And again, it starts up automatically from the brain region. It's unconscious. There's nothing we can do about it. And I was dripping in perspiration again because I'm walking for miles and trying to just, yeah, I was following other people as well. But trying to find the way out was just crazy. And, uh, and so they called, pulled me over at one stage and I thought, no, Matt, I'm not surprised that they have because I look like, I probably look like I'm riddled with anxiety and look like I'm guilty of something. So I just laughed it off um, and got home and had a shower. <laughs> Definitely just needed it. So I want you to remember that we can do hard things. We have to be willing to have a go at doing the one next step because our whole internal system wants to keep us safe, all right, from the possible uh, a verbal or emotional abuse that we may cop if we go and do something different. So it's up to us to have our self-talk happening and to begin to reframe the automatic thoughts as well. Okay, so remember your homework tonight is to... Be aware of your thoughts and be aware of where your thoughts compare yourself and your situation to other people. And that way you're going to start taking one step towards recognising the, the wound, the abandonment wound, the emotional neglect and where you've developed an inner critic. Thanks for joining in this morning, girls. We'll be back with more information around this and I hope you get your homework done. Um... And remember, too, that we can be oh, like, oh, I'm not like that. I spent years saying, oh, I'm not like that because I didn't have the language for it either. Uh, and I didn't realise how powerful denial and minimisation were either. I didn't have language for that. But once I had the language, I was able to say, oh, thank goodness, now I've got language for what's happening internally and I can learn how to manage this and do it well. Love you all heaps. Thanks for joining in and I will see you again tomorrow morning with more information to help us and a little homework for you to help you with your one next step. Bye for now.